questions, and I don't think um, oceans or soils have made it to the agenda of these leaders. And, you know, it's okay, but there's still the need to go and bring these issues because in soils we have a big biological carbon sink that can contribute tremendously to the removal of carbon from the atmosphere and put it back where it belongs in the soils that are feeding us and are feeding so much life that we all depend upon. So, uh, the word of Alan Savory, some of you, how many of you have heard of holistic management and Alan Savory? So all of you, so he really does not need introductions, but someone will be introducing him. But the work of Alan Savory has been some, somehow relegated to the ranching world, but really is, 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 a, is, a, is this amazing um, planning and decision-making framework that allows us as humans to be able to manage and live with complexity more successfully than we have done in the past. And grasslands are the landscape in which we are focusing our, our attention. And, um, and so Colorado, for example, is 75% rangelands, grasslands, that are degrading at a very alarming rate. And uh, we, we as Coloradans, and as people that make decisions in our food and fibers every day, we have the ability to influence or have a voice. But our voices alone sometimes are not heard. So these small gatherings around the world, each one in their own context, allow us to unify it, unify our voices and our message around a very simple message, but that touches on our lives, our health, the future, climate, water, food, if we just pay attention to our soils. So, um, so the soil manifesto is here, the living dynamic ecosystem, the basis of sustainable and productive agriculture, the world's greatest reservoir of water, and actually the regulator of the water cycles and the nutrient cycles, and, and therefore um, climate. And uh, through regenerating the soils, we're addressing many of the crises. The climate is our focus because we're taking this to, to, um, to our um, leaders in, in Paris. But uh, it's also the food crisis and the water, the, the, the water crises and poverty and all these symptoms of environmental malfunction. So we, we're getting together and all, how many of you have not signed the agreement? Please do the, the soil manifesto. Go sign. How many of you have not? So there's a few hands. Please do sign it because then we, we have a. How, how many do we have now, Sarah? 300? Uh, three, 400. 400. <laughs> Just launched it. We're launching it today. So 400 of these voices, and then 400 in Turkey, 400 in Australia, 400 in Patagonia. And we start bringing all these voices around this important issue then we're hoping to present it to the United Nations, um, the Commission to Combat the Certification and the Climate Change uh, Framework. And the idea will be to say, you are supported by many, many people who care about these issues. Let's look at agriculture, how our food and fibers are produced, and let's do something about it. And as consumers, as citizens, we can learn how to, if we don't get to touch and the soil and smell it and, and, and nurture it and protect it as we have here, we can do it through our actions in, in the cities, through the food we buy, through the, the pressures we're putting into our policy uh, makers and into our corporate leaders. So, so this is what we're here to celebrate. So, and with this, we have two amazing keynotes. One is Alan Savory, the other one is Hancho Lovins, who does not know Hancho Lovins. <laughs> it's better to go, who doesn't know. So, um, so we have these amazing uh, keynotes with us, and I want to bring to the stage my friend Seth Itzkan. Uh, Seth that has been with the holistic management movement and has been a supporter and a fan for many years, and uh, he is the co-founder of he's a climate activist and the co-founder of Soul for Climate, an organization that has shared the beautiful name of his organization for this particular initiative or how eloquent it, it says what we want to say so for climate and he will be here with us partnering and coming with us to Paris to do uh, some of these uh, sharing of all of us uh, desires to put more attention into our souls and he will be introducing Alan Saber. So, Yeah, it's really uh, quite
pleasure to be here today in support of the Savory Institute and the Soil for Climate Celebration and the Soil Manifesto. This is something dear to my heart, and uh, it's an honor to share to share this opportunity with everyone. And um, I have a few brief uh, comments um, and an opportunity for a quick audience uh, exercise. Um, as many of you know, global warming is an existential threat of our time, and soil restoration may be our strongest ally in countering this menace and creating a livable future. The benefits of restoring soil are many. In addition to providing safe haven for atmospheric carbon, soil restoration creates localized cooling, builds resilience to droughts and floods, and helps produce nourishing food. The work of Alan Savory and the Savory Institute to restore the grasslands of the world is one of the quintessential noble tasks of our time. And again, it's an honor to be associated with this mission. In introducing Alan, I was asked to briefly explain how a climate activist and vegetarian for 11 years came to be an advocate of holistic plant grazing in the work of Alan Savory. It goes back to 1972 when as a wee lad, I was watching TV with my physicist father. In what was probably the first story on global warming to make prime time, the anchor man said the temperatures may rise one or two degrees in the next century. Well, that's not good, said my father with a concerned expression. I didn't know what it was, but I knew it was important. Today we hear of a possible four degree warmer world. As we speak, the heads of nations are in Paris for meetings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. They are hoping to achieve binding agreements on emissions reductions. It is wonderful that they are taking this matter seriously and we hope for their success. Unfortunately, as many of you are probably also aware, even if the binding agreements on the emissions reductions are met, and even if emissions were ceased, the hammer of climate change would still be upon us. Their goal is to limit warming to two degrees, but even that is devastating. The IPCC states, and I quote, a large fraction of anthropogenic climate change resulting from CO2 emissions is irreversible on a multi-century to millennial time scale, except in the case of a large net removal of CO2 from the atmosphere over a sustained period, unquote. So what is the answer to this call for a large net removal? Audience participation, please. Somebody <laughs> else. Exactly. And uh, what is the largest ecosystem on the planet where soils exist? Grassland. Audience, grasslands. Very good. Let's give each other a round. Um, yes, grasslands are the largest ecosystem. They cover approximately 40% of the land and non-ice surface of the planet. According to University of Oregon scientist Ray Bertow, the formation of grassland soils in the last 30 million years in co-evolution with large grazing animals is responsible for an atmospheric carbon drawdown of over 500 gigatons. That is more than all the carbon added to the atmosphere through fossil fuel burning since the dawn of the fossil fuel age in the mid 18th century. Yeah. Unfortunately, of course, much of the carbon has been lost through degradation of grassland soils and largely through the decimation of large herds of animals that were essential for water and nutrient recycling in those ecosystems. Alan Savory, in his discovery of the positive relationship of megafauna with grasslands, has unearthed a most important revelation. And his demonstration of a livestock management approach it harnesses this revelation and restores the evolutionary patterns essential for grassland health is one of the landmark achievements of our time. It not only helps heal the land and capture carbon, it also replenishes water tables, reverses the scourge of deserts, provides gainful employment for land-based enterprise, and in general, offers hope for a planet and its people so in need of good news and positive images for the future. It is largely because of Dallin's work that myself and my car, co colleague, Carl Tiedemann, form Soil for Climate. It has been a joy to visit with Alan in Africa and to get a deeper understanding of him and his work. And now for the second opportunity for audience participation, 
Please join me in welcoming a man I'm proud to be associated with, Mr. Alex Davis. I'm not shaking hands because I don't like him. I'm not shaking hands because I've got a cold. I'm feeling terrible. But anyway, thank you, sir. Thank you for coming this evening. Uh, Thank you for coming. Sorry? Do you want a whiskey? <laughs> not yet. I hope I'm not. I speak awful trash when I'm sober. <laughs> it's not a doomsday talk, as, as you know, tonight. Um, I love what Daniela and the younger folks who are taking over at SI are doing, of beginning to unite Team Humanity. I think we are one of the very few organizations literally around the world that is bringing everybody together. Everywhere people meet in clusters, in organizations, be they environmental or whatever. And what I see as I go around our pubs and so on is I find farmers, ranchers, researchers, environmentalists, pastoralists, everybody just coming together as human beings and beginning to provide solutions and work. And so thank you for supporting this. Uh, movement. <coughs> we do, I don't have to spell it out to you too much, I believe we're facing the most dangerous time ever in modern humans' lives. Uh, the Before I spoke at our London gathering, I got a shock when I read a report from a think tank in Oxford of prominent scientists, philosophers and others in which they looked at survival of the human species and the five greatest dangers to our survival as a species. And I was shocked that one of them wasn't climate change. And they explained why. Because they feel that with what's happening with climate change, some parts of our planet will still be habitable. To me, that's shocking. That means billions of people are going to be dead in the most terrible suffering and violence that this world has never seen before. And I think there's more hope than that. But I do, and I've often expressed it, uh, feel that this is perhaps the greatest and last war we will ever fight, greater than all the wars ever fought. And this is the war to learn to live with ourselves and our environment in harmony. If we fail this one, we're gone. So it is a very, very serious time. So I never, I feel there's never been a more vital time for us to start uniting the team, humanity, as I call it, um, wherever we're from in the world, whatever we do. Now the, <coughs> the problem is, of course, what's today called uh, global desertification, climate change, and the fate of our, our soils on which it Hinges. When I became deeply concerned, I was saying to somebody earlier, it was 60 years ago, as a young man, seeing what was happening in North Africa at the time, and uh, we didn't have any of today's buzzwords, biodiversity loss, desertification, climate change. I was just seeing appalling environmental degradation and the consequences of it, and saying so something has to be done, and trying to find something constructed to do about it. Agriculture is the key to this. Um, I was looking at the word soil. Take off the S and you've got oil. Everybody's blaming oil. No, we need to be looking at soil. All right? Uh, agriculture is the production of food and fiber from the land's world, uh, the, the world's land and waters. Everything is involved now on our planet. There's almost no part of our planet not involved in that, and the crop production is only 5% of that. So 95% is under agriculture in some form or another, but not uh, crop production. Now, <clears throat> without agriculture, we cannot have an orchestra, a choir, a church, an army, a university, a gathering like this. Nothing we do is possible without agriculture. It is the foundation of everything. Now, we've had a massive disconnect from reality in this mechanistic worldview we've had um, <clears throat> since Newton and science developing. And I often say to people, nowhere 
is that express more than Nobel Prizes. They have attracted our best brains. That's what they were aimed at doing. They've attracted our best brains in the world to the areas that were considered important for humans. Physics, chemistry, they argue about mathematics, um, you know, literature, etc. Nothing for environmental agriculture wasn't considered important to humanity. I think that alone has done enormous damage to the world by drawing our best brains into areas that are trivial by comparison. <coughs> and how's agriculture doing? I don't want to belay the point, most of you know it. Uh, the soil scientists who, whose figures are, I believe, incredibly conservative, have looked mostly at the crop lands, and their estimates range around 75 billion tons of soil a year, dead, destroyed, and eroding. Now, we can't grasp 75 billion, uh, that figure, so I did a little bit of arithmetic, and that's about 10 tons, it's more than 10 tons, for every human alive today, when we're expecting our population to rise to 9 or 10 billion. If you can't think of 10 tons per human alive today of soil being destroyed, think of it as 20 times as much as food we need. We need about half a ton of food per human a year for a healthy human, and we're producing 20 times as much of that of dead, eroding soil. To me, it's the most frightening statistic in the world. <clears throat> now, when we deal with this, the belief uh, through our institutions, our universities, everything, uh, is that we've got a great many options. I had quite a bit of kickback when I said in the TED talk on desertification, we only have one option. People objected to a scientist saying one option, but I say that advisedly, and I would love for any scientist in the world to show where I'm wrong, either in logic or science. We do not have a lot of options. When we think of a lot of options, we're thinking of technology, because we use technology everywhere in our lives. And at uh, COP21, now in Paris, please believe me, most of the talk will be around technology. And when I listened this morning to a long interview of Pre uh, President Obama in Paris, he said he'd just been holding a discussion this morning with Bill Gates, who was very optimistic in saying we could pour billions more dollars into finding technological solutions. That is what the world is looking for, with technological solutions. Our options are very few, and let's just use common sense tonight as, as we look at them. Why I say our options are very few is because we're a tool-using animal. We cannot do anything without a tool. If you think otherwise, any of you now go and have a drink of water but don't use a cup, a tap, a pipe, or any technology. How would you do it? You see my point? But you could write a poem. Sorry? You can write a poem without a tool. You can, you can do... Yes, but a poem won't affect our environment. I'm talking about everything we do to, in our lives, our actions, our things that affect the environment. Thank you for that correction. All right? We cannot influence our environment except by picking up a tool. So to put this right in the world, to regenerate our soils and to deal with the problem, we're going to have to do through, through, through tools. Now, if we put our tools into categories, what do we have? We have technology. That began with sticks and stones, like other tool-using animals. And we could not influence our environment. No matter how much we chipped the stones, sharpened the sticks, we could not influence our environment. About a million years ago, we got the use of fire, and then about 500,000 years ago or so, we actually learned to light fire. So now we had two tools, technology and fire. And then we could go and melt stones and go to the bronze, the copper, the iron age, and every single thing in this room, including the clothing you're wearing, was made possible by fire. There's nothing in this room that wasn't made possible, was possible before fire. 
That meant our technology began rapidly advancing and is still, and we can put a man on the moon. All right, so we've got the category of technology, artifacts of the human mind, made possible with fire, and we've got fire. So 99%, 99.9% of our existence had two tools, technology and fire. And we began to change the world dramatically once we had that second tool. Now, the only other tool we have to rest or to, to manage our environment at large is to rest, to conserve, conservation. We don't talk about rest, we talk about conservation. That means resting the environment to let things recover, biodiversity. And that began around about the last 10,000 years. Probably with pastoralists moving their animals to let the land recover, or crop farmers rotating their crops to let the land recover. So we have three tools now. And the only other tool we've ever had is living organisms to make cheese and wine, or we can plant trees, etc. Right? So bring our tools down to categories, and there they are. Now, when we look at the problem facing us, regenerating the world's agricultural soils, reversing man-made desertification, there are man there are natural deserts, the Gobi and the Nile, where there's no rain. We don't need to worry about those. It's the man-made desertification we need to worry. Uh, Elizabeth Sartoris uh, spoke before me once, and I loved it. She showed a shot from space, and she said, if you'd watched the Earth from space over the last 50,000 years, you would describe humans as a desert-making species. That's the biggest change you would see on, on this planet. It's roughly two-thirds of the world's land that is deserved by them. All right, so this problem that we face is essentially a biological problem. It needs the biological sciences to address it. When we look at technology to address that, even if we use our imaginations to an extraordinary level, the most imaginative technology we could ever dream of cannot deal with that biological problem, because it is a biological problem. Fire causes the problem and has been causing it for 50,000 years in Australia, the last 10, 15,000 years on this continent, etc. Resting the land is counterintuitive to us. That's why I showed a picture in the TED Talk of totally rested land in the United States, managed by the National Park Service in New Mexico, with deep gullies eroding, worse than anything we've got in Africa. That's happening right here under rest. Rest is the most destructive tool we have in the seasonal rainfall environments of the world. It's the exact opposite of what it does in the oceans, where it's the most powerful tool we have, or in the perennially humid environments, the tropical forests, east and west coasts of this country, Anywhere the humidity is high throughout the year, we have no tool more powerful than resting the land to restore biodiversity. But as we go into seasonal precipitation and long dry periods, and particularly lower rainfall, it becomes exceedingly destructive. And that was unknown to us. It took us a long time to understand what was happening there. So when we look at the tools available to us, we find that we're vilifying livestock the two things most vilified are fossil fuels and livestock in blaming climate change. But we plant trees because that's within our beliefs. So we look at what's happening. Most people are good. Most people are doing their best. We're trying. And so we look at Israel, and I've been there, looked at it in the negative. They're spending 10,000 euros per hectare channeling water running off of non-effective rainfall because of desertification to plant trees in uh, small areas. They're taking the livestock away from proud, ancient, Bedouin pastoralist tribes and paying the men an allowance depending on how many children they have. So the men are breeding like anything, and that's going to spell disaster for them while desertification continues. I visited with Daniela, um, the United Arab Emirates, and they kindly uh, flew us around in helicopters, looking at thousands of hectares of wonderful work, planting trees, desalinating water, 
piping water in, drip irrigation. They've spent $30 billion on 1% of the land, and as we photographed, you could just see the desert sands blowing through it. China is planting millions of trees and removing the livestock of pastoral people, um, and yet Beijing is getting more than a quarter of a ton of sand dumped on the city in some days now. All right, all of these are good efforts, but no amount of planting trees will ever deal with desertification because the land isn't desertifying because it lacked trees. It's desertifying because it lacked animals, as was said earlier. All right, so what are we left with? When people object to me saying, we've only got one alternative left. We literally have livestock. We can use livestock to mimic nature of the past. We've been doing it for over 50 years, and it works. It works incredibly well. Because nature doesn't distinguish between the type of animal, whether it's a buffalo or a cow or an elephant or whatever. And how to do so was the dilemma I faced way back in the 1960s. Um, I was never a vegan, but I was more fanatical environmentalist than any in this country. I was taught, I was brought up to believe cattle were the problem, I believed it. Um, I was on public record in my country saying I was prepared to shoot goddamn rocks. And I found I was wrong scientifically, I backed down publicly, and when I realized we have only got livestock, we have got to learn how to do it. And I didn't know how to do it. We'd had 100 years of all sorts of grazing, rotational grazing systems. All of those, all of them, had worsened the desertification in the United States and in Africa. We had 10,000 years of mob grazing or herding, or whatever you like to call it, of ancient, proud, <coughs> prosperous people with incredible knowledge of their environment and their lifestyle herding their livestock. They had created the great uh, deserts, man-made deserts of antiquity. So what are you going to do when herding, bunching, moving, grazing, rotations, nothing is working? That's the dilemma I faced in the 1960s. But I knew we had to do it. I felt a bit like that old statement I loved of Churchill's when I was a boy growing up, when he said if something absolutely has to be done. All of your experts explain to you how impossible it is. It's simple. Just get rid of your experts and do it. <laughs> and that's what I had to do. And I, and I worked out the way by just looking at other professions. I actually looked at the military and how they dealt with incredibly complicated situations, constantly changing. What had they worked out over 300 years? building on their experience of every battle, it was easy. They'd worked it out. There was no need to reinvent anything else. So I just took straight military 300 years of experience. All I had to do then was to put it on a charge, because they had fought battles for short periods of time. Pastors, ranchers, farmers have to plan a year, two years ahead. So just put it on a charge, because you can express time across the top. You can express four dimensions. It worked, and it's kept working, and it keeps working. So we call it today holistic plan grazing, and that way we can now reverse desertification. There's no question about it. And so we need to use that or something better as we develop. Because science always keeps advancing, and I hope somebody can improve on that and develop something even better. But right now, that is working, and has worked for half a century. Now, coming back to uh, COP21, the world is focusing on it, and they're focusing on climate. Let's look at climate first. Why is the climate changing? Essentially because of four atmospheric pollutants, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and black carbon, three gases, one particulate matter, and because of global soil destruction and desertification, biomass burning, which puts the black carbon in the air. So we've got four pollutants and desertification. Now, 
With technology, rest, and fire, what can we stop putting into the atmosphere? It's very, very simple. It's just common sense, one on one. All we can stop is the fossil fuels. We need billions of dollars invested in finding alternative, benign mass fuels. No question of it. Now, if we stop that, roughly four of the four pollutants, roughly half is coming from fossil fuels. The other half is coming from agriculture. What can we stop coming from agriculture using technology, fire or rest? Climate change will continue. I'll set my life on it. If you bring it down to the simplicity, you begin to see it. Instead of getting caught up in endless discussions about different forms of technology. All right, so we don't need to only stop it. As Seth uh, said, we've got to draw down that legacy load, particularly of carbon, one of the other gases. So now, where are we going to put it is the first thing we have to ask. The oceans are already acidifying, and we're losing life and functionality in the oceans. Planting trees. Society and all our institutions believe in planting trees. There's nothing counterintuitive there. Consequently, our institutions are planting millions of trees, as I mentioned earlier. I'm afraid that won't solve it, because trees are part of the ambient cycle of life. You are all carbon. We are all carbon. Life is a carbon cycle. And the trees, if we plant millions of trees, will pull carbon out just like cattle do or you do. Anything living does. But when they die, it goes back. So they might buy you a little time for a hundred years till the tree dies. <coughs> Essentially, most of that will go back because not much is held in soil. That is why the great green growing regions of the world are not on forest soils. They're on former grassland soils. So we're now left with one other place we can put it, the soil. And then you come to grassland soils. Because grasses, without getting into the technical thing, when they are grazed, sacrifice root, put up more leaf, get grazed, sacrifice root, put up leaf, recover, grow root, they effectively act like pumps, pumping carbon into the soil. And trees, when they lose the leaves, don't do that. <coughs> so you can look at grasses like pumps pumping carbon down, which trees don't do. So we've got the soil. Now, if we're going to put the excess in the soil, what can we put down in the soil using technology, fire, or resting land? Almost nothing. Now, look at these two questions and just add livestock. A ballistic plan grazing and livestock is a tool. What can we remove or stop going into the atmosphere? It now becomes possible to stop all of it. Not only just using technology for the fossil fuels, but using livestock to help us regenerate soils. So it becomes possible to stop it going up and it becomes possible to the door. I'm not saying easy. It's not going to be easy. We've let it go so far. But I like to go with things that are possible, not with things that I can see, hey, this is not even possible. It makes more sense to go with what is possible. So leaving the climate one then, unless we start looking at livestock, as I say, seriously, I don't believe we're going to be able to address it. Now let's look at another aspect of Paris. We had the Twin Towers bombing. We got the reaction of that. Um, Bin Laden's been killed. Now you've got the Paris attacks, and they're going after ISIS with uh, military reaction to it. Um, when they have destroyed ISIS, what will be the next? Where is this coming from? In all the basic military manuals, it's standard understanding and practice 
that when you're dealing with guerrilla warfare, it's not only essential to fight the guerrilla forces, etc., it's essential to stop the recruitment. That is more important than the other side of the thing. So where is most of this recruitment coming from? When we look at the most problematic region of the world, right across North Africa, right up through to China, through Pakistan and Afghanistan to India, that big area of the world, far bigger than the United States, is all reserved for you. Only livestock can correct that. Only livestock can feed people from about 95% of that land. And we are vilifying livestock. That is a perfect storm, breeding ground, recruiting ground for fanatics. So if we kill one lot of fanatics, please believe me, the next will arise. It's been happening in that region for thousands of years, and it'll keep happening. There's more to come. Now, how are we going to address that? Again, it becomes through the soils, but we're going to have to speak up as people, ordinary people, with common sense, etc. Recently, the United Nations, and these are good people doing their best, all the institutions working with them, have come up with 17 new sustainable global development goals. The previous millennium goals having failed, we've now got 17 new ones. I have read through all I can of those to see what they are up to. It's 100% dealing with the symptoms of desertification. Increasing droughts, floods, poverty, social breakdown, violence, climate change. There is not one single dollar going to addressing the cause. So I can stand before you now and absolutely guarantee you it is going to worsen the situation. Unless common sense starts prevailing and we start doing something just as ordinary people around the world starting to insist on some common sense. I'd like to conclude now. There are many, many issues, many conflicting views, and it's easy to get caught up in them all. I like to sit there for myself, and I've done this all my life, and not listen to all the complaints and all the things we should do. I sit there and think, what, what's the key to this? Where's the point we need to be focusing on? What really matters? If we solve that, these other things will come right. I really think we need to start focusing, and it's beginning to happen, on the soils. We're hearing more discussion about the soils now than we did even a year ago, two years ago. Daniela, so you'll remember, I think it was Bill Gates said he was going to launch a new green revolution. I immediately said, I'm horrified. Let's launch a brown revolution. <laughs> That's what we need. We've got to focus on the soils, and it's beginning to happen. Now we've got to speed that and keep that, that going. But I think we need two focuses, because if we all focus on the soils, so what? Focusing on the soils isn't going to be enough. We've got to focus on the management. Because it is not the fossil fuels that are causing the problem, or the livestock, it is the management that is causing the problem. We're going to need fossil fuels for thousands of years, for the many things those large atoms produce, those molecules produce. There are many things that humans are going to need. What is at fault is this mass burning of fossil fuels for energy. That's what at fault, and that's coming from our management. And our management condemning livestock and doing the things I mentioned earlier. So we have got to start recognizing that management is the problem, not the tools or the resources we have. That old old saying, it's a poor workman who blames his tools. And globally now we are blaming our tools and not our management that we need to be looking at. So I believe that what, what we've almost accidentally stumbled on in holistic management, where we deal with complexity, social, environmental, economic complexity, through getting people together, deciding how we want our lives to be, tying that to our life-supporting environment, using that as the overall context 
for our policies, for our actions. I truly believe that offers hope for our grandchildren and future generations. Thank you. We will give you opportunities, obviously it's a small crowd, so you have the opportunity to speak or come and ask questions now or later, but we have a couple other people that would like the opportunity to speak, and so next we have a local favorite, someone who is known for sustainability, who has been actually working with Alan for 20, 30 years, 30 years, and uh, is a huge advocate of the Savory Institute, the work in the soils. Uh, she just recently was leading in the efforts of bringing faith into the conversation around the encyclical by the Pope, and her efforts in sustainability and sustainability business practices and management has been recognized by Newsweek and multiple publications that are known for recognizing leaders who are making a difference. And so with all that being said, we want to bring Hunter Robbins up to speak to us today. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. I think there is no more important conversation that you could be engaged in. Give me a second to play with the technology, which I am very fond. Welcome to the Anthropocene. <laughs> we now live in a whole new geological era. When you were born, it was the Holocene, an unusually stable geologic time. No more. We humans are now the dominant geologic force on the planet. We're changing the chemistry of the atmosphere, of the oceans, and as Alan said, we're changing the geology. And we're in a bit of a mess, yeah? This study was released, Alan cited the study that he saw a couple of years ago. This came out in March, funded by NASA, that <coughs> looked at total civilizational collapse throughout history. And it found it's actually fairly common. And when it happens, it tends to last for a long time. Two things drive it. You overrun your resource base, or you have high inequality. Hello? <laughs> We're badly overrunning our resource base. The scientists at the Stockholm Resilience Institute, Johan Rockström and team, have shown that of the nine planetary boundaries, we've exceeded four of them. We're risking the others. We are particularly, as Alan said, depleting the soils. And of all of the ways of overrunning our planetary boundaries, that's the one that is really going to bite us. Global Biodiversity Outlook 3, science from Dr. Tom Lovejoy at the Smithsonian, a lot of scientists, they found three of the Earth's ecosystems are already tipping into collapse. Coral reefs, sorry scuba divers, business as usual, perhaps as early as 2030, there will be no living coral reefs on planet Earth. The Amazon is desertifying, drying up, burning, and as Alan said, we're acidifying the oceans. This is our choice. If we act now, if COP21 can reach an agreement, we have the opportunity to have a damaged planet, but one that is yet tolerable. The other choice is hell on Earth. And it will probably be a 6 degrees C, perhaps as high as 11 degrees C, if we burn all of the fossil fuels that are now on the balance sheets of many of the sovereign wealth funds and companies like Exxon. Their business model is to dig them up and burn them, and if they do, we roast. Inequality. This is actually an old number. In 2016, the number, this is from Credit Suisse and Oxfam, 80 people will have as much wealth as all the rest of humanity. 
Dr. Kay Broadworth at Oxford talks about the donut. She has a new book coming out, Donut Economics, that I highly recommend. She says, what we need is to find this safe operating space for humanity, where we are meeting the human minimums. We're providing the essentials for human beings to have dignity, and yet we're below the planetary boundaries. And for some reason, we're going backwards. Here's climate change. In the 80s, we had a billion dollar storm per year. In the 90s, two such storms. In the aughts, five billion dollar storms a year. 2011, a new record, 14 of these buggers. We are down a little bit from that, but we continue to have years with more than $10 billion storms. Alan mentioned the problem across the MENA area. Middle East, North Africa. Remember the, uh, the Arab Spring? It was kicked off by a food riot in Tunisia that then spread to Syria. And now Europe is facing probably a million refugees. Half of the population of Syria is now displaced and moving. the devout refugee camp in the north of Africa, what would you do? You can no longer stay where you have been. You know because you have a cell phone that there is a part of the world where life goes on as normal. What would you do? Would you stay and die? No. You'd go to France where there is now the jungle at Calais of people trying to reach the channel, to go under the English Channel and make it to the UK, or make it to Germany, or make it somewhere in Europe where they have a chance of a better life. Lester Brown, in his book, Full Planet, Empty Plates, says, we're very close to a food crisis globally. We're one poor harvest away from chaos in the grain markets. Food and water scarcity, this is the desertification that Alan is talking about. And yet land is now a hot commodity. The Chinese are buying farmland. The businesses are buying farmland because they know this is the scarce resource. And who would you like to have managing that land? The farmer who knows it, who was born there, who grew up with it, or a distant corporation? Now, if all of this is beginning to sound a little like that old book, Limits to Growth, that book was wrong, yeah? Well, maybe. In uh, April of 2012, the Smithsonian was so unkind as to take those old collapse graphs and plot the actual data from 1972 until 2000. That's the solid line. The dashed lines are um, the original projections. We're right on track. This is business as usual. Business as usual, we are aiming for collapse. And you can make your cause, but it's not going to be pretty. So what will it take to avoid collapse? A group of us at the Club of Rome over the last six months have been looking at this question. One, is it possible? for humanity to avoid collapse. And the Club of Rome was the group that, to whom the book Limits to Growth was a report. And so some of our members are saying, no, it's not possible. And I said, it has to be. You can't say that. First of all, we took $100,000 from the foundation to look into this question. You can't go back to the foundation and say, sorry, we're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Especially not if you want more money out of them. <laughs> and furthermore, it's not right. Some people say it's too late. Don't do this, because you didn't put you in a very bad mood, but you can go and Google near-term human extinction. Guy McPherson? Guy McPherson. Who says humans go extinct by 2050. With a lot of science behind it. When I first read that, 
it put me in a very bad mood. I was going the next day to talk to the UN about the uh, Sustainable Development Goals with uh, Dr. Kevin Noonan, who is one of Rockstrom's crew, eminent scientist. And I said, Kevin, have you seen this stuff? He said, yeah. So is it true? He said, we all know the situation is grave. But he said, on balance, no, I don't think it is. I think we have options. Oh, oh thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, guys. We're humans. We are the creative species. So is it possible to get out of this mess? Yeah, I think it is. And so does the Holy Father. As Trey mentioned, we had a meeting last week uh, that, that Anna and Sandy Butterfield were responsible for making possible. Pulling together leaders from the faith community political community, business, and trying to step up and take action on this amazing encyclical. And if you have not read this, please do. It's one of the most amazing documents ever written. The Pope is calling for a dialogue of humanity on how do we create this world that we want. I like this framing from Bill Reed of Regenesis, who says, sustainability is only halfway there. If you will, it's getting our nose above water. We are now in the degenerative world. We're destroying life on Earth. And all the things that so many of us have been working on, doing less harm, Building green buildings, the whole alphabet soup of metrics, SRI and IIRC and all of the UN agencies, all of those are rungs on a ladder climbing towards sustainability. The ability to go on, that's not enough. Where is it that we're going to? Bill and others, actually going back to Buckminster Fuller, framed this concept of regenerative. Bill points out, nature is sustainable, not because it's set out to be, but because it's regenerative. I work with a board member of the Savory Institute, John Fullerton, who points out that our whole mental model of how we run the economy is wrong. At present, we, the planet, are in service to the economy. So after 9-11, Bush said, go shopping. He was actually right. In an economic sense, if in a crisis you behave as if there's nothing wrong, economically there's nothing wrong. And the economy is in service to finance. We flow money to the top very efficiently. What's wrong with this picture? It's wrong way around. We need an economy in service to life. Finance is a tool. It's a way of bringing liquidity to the real economy which ought to be in service to human well-being and natural integrity. John has written an amazing paper called Regenerative Capitalism that I highly commend to you. And he laid out eight principles, drawn a lot from Alan's work. He's been working with Alan for a while. Of what does it mean to be regenerative? This concept of right relationship, of you know, do we serve the economy or does it serve us? Holistic wealth. Money is not wealth. Community is wealth. Well-being is wealth. Innovative and adaptive, entrepreneurial, the ability to begin anew. Empowered participation, having a say in the economy that affects you. Edge effect abundance, this biomimetic concept that in nature the most abundant ecosystems are where Two of them come together because you have diversity. Robust circulation. We're a throwaway society. Stuff goes through once. We once calculated that of all the stuff mobilized by the economy, less than 1% of it ever gets put in a product and is still there six months after sale. All the rest is waste. And so if we close the loops, create circular economies, we can begin to change that. Balance between 
efficiency and resilience. And then, perhaps most important, honoring place and community. Wendell Berry said, because we have not made our lives to fit our places, the forests are ruined, the fields eroded, the streams polluted, the mountains overturned. Hope then to belong to your place by your own knowledge of what it is that no other place is, and by your caring for it as you care for no other place. This place that you belong to, though it is not yours, for it was from the beginning and will be to the end. Lemo also said, what I stand for is what I stand on. So, we need to celebrate this real economy, the economy in service to life. And we need to pull into the conversation those who have been left out, the artists, the poets, the dispossessed, the people who have lived on the edges, the pastoralists, who know how to live in these brittle areas. This edge effect abundance, where two ecosystems come together, celebrating diversity. <coughs> Pete Seeger, the gentle folk singer, said the key to the future of the world is finding the optimistic stories and letting them be known. William Gibson said, the future is already here, it's just not widely distributed. <laughs> we have all the technologies that we need to solve all of the problems facing us. Nearly two-thirds of the carbon emissions not coming from the soil come from 90 entities. What this means is we know who they are, we have their addresses we can do something about them. Christina Figueres, who runs UNFCCC, who I'll see in Paris in, what, four days? So where capital goes over the next 15 years is going to decide whether we're actually able to address climate change and what kind of a century we're going to have. These flows of money matter a lot. Are you investing in life or in its destruction? Dr. Mark Jacobson at Stanford University has shown we can meet all the world's energy needs by 2030 purely from renewable energy. And it's happening. Renewables are winning. Interestingly, you know, people are saying, oh, Paris is a failure. These INDCs, uh, intended nationally determined contributions, are just voluntary. Well, what we actually have with this just voluntary is a race to the top for the first time. India came out and said 40% uh, renewables by 2030. And then three days later, Brazil came out and said 43. <laughs> we have countries starting to trump each other, which is very exciting. Here's where it gets fun. Tony Sabat is an entrepreneur out of Silicon Valley, Stanford professor. He says, by 2030, the world will be 100% renewable in its energy. Not electricity only, energy. Because of four reasons. The dramatic fall in the price of solar. The dramatic fall in the price of batteries. I was talking to a guy today in uh, uh, Buffalo, New York. Uh, not exactly the solar climate. He's going to put solar on his house, ran the numbers, five cents a kilowatt hour. What do you guys pay? 11, 12, Excel, and rising. Yeah, go municipal. And go 100% renewable. It already is cheaper. Third factor is electric cars. Fourth is the driverless car. Tony says by 2030, inevitably, we will be 100% renewable. Assume he's wrong. This is the numbers on the fall in the price of solar. Next year, the entire US solar will be at grid parity with the electricity you get from the wall. Somebody's wrong, suppose it's 2040, suppose it's 2050, you still meet the UN's goals of decarbonizing. Don't take Tony's word for it. National Bank of Abu Dhabi, by 2025, solar is at four to six cents a kilowatt hour. It already is in Buffalo. Little Tesla, 
valued at half the market capitalization of General Motors despite selling 300 times fewer cars. Why? Because it's not a car company, it's a battery company. And again, dramatic fall off in the price of batteries. This, of course, is giving the utilities a very hard time. These are the two big utilities in Europe. The top 20 European utilities have lost 600 billion in value over the past five years. RWE's profits down 60%, EON's down 91% in the first nine months of last year. Why? Because Europe is going renewable. Janine Benyus asks, how does nature do business? This is the same sort of question Alan is asking. Nature runs on sunlight at low energy flows with nothing persistently toxic, making everything near to something that's alive at ambient temperature, shopping locally with no waste. Alan said it, in nature, carbon is not the world's greatest poison. It's the building block of all of life. So how can we use carbon better? This company is taking carbon out of flue gas from, say, natural gas plants and turning it into plastic. Doing very well at it. This kind of entrepreneuring is what gives us jobs. The Kauffman Foundation showed that in all but seven years from 1977 until today, the big companies have been net job destroyers. The job creators are the entrepreneurs. The circular economy, there is a round earth out there. Stuff does go around. Dr. Martha Gilles has shown that if you implement a circular economy, closing the waste loops, you'd add a trillion dollars a year to Europe's economy. And then we get to soil. We think we exist because of this big brain of ours. We don't. We exist because of six inches of soil and the fact that it rains. Although when I said that, Daniela said, that's degraded soil. Remember, when the pioneers came across the Great Plains, it was 10 feet of thick black soil. It's now down to inches because of the way that we're conducting agriculture. We hear from Monsanto and the others that it requires industrial agriculture to feed the world. One farmer can feed, you know, pick your number, 100, 1,000. Not according to UNCTAD. Their report in 2013 said the only way we're going to feed the world is with smallholder organic agriculture that respects the soil, that regenerates the soil. If we are going to meet this two degree C number, this is rising, uh, rising temperature above the pre-industrial level. We're at one degree C above pre-industrial level now, and we're already seeing pretty nasty consequences. Two degree C is going to be very, very nasty. It's a political number. We really should be shooting for 1.5. 350 parts per million. We're at 400 and growing now. If we increase soil carbon by just 2%, we'd soak up all the carbon that humans have ever emitted. And as Alan said, we know how to do this. If you haven't watched his TED Talk, do so. I know because I implemented it. This is a piece of ground I managed on the other side of the mountains. A thousand acres of ground that John Denver had bought. And he rested it, or his people did, because to them, cows were evil. They were environmentalists. So they took all the cows off the land. And it was overrun with noxious weeds. It was desertifying. We brought Alan to the land. Remember walking the land? And started, we put cows back, that little black spot in the corner is cows. Fenced by electric fences so that they stay dense packed, move. They eat everything, and then you move the fence, and they move over. Here are the results. This is a fence line with holistic grazing and conventional grazing. One side has grass. Pictures taken 
on essentially the same place, looking one way, looking the other. And the one in the middle is the same place one year and then 10 years later. Dan Baggett has shown that you can use animals to reclaim land. This is totally desertified. You turn the cows out, you feed them. A year later with six inches of rain. Mine drillings. Turn the cows out. Feed them. <coughs> and you have grass where the other side was where they had receded. This is also better business. The ranchers that are getting into grass beef because it's healthier for you. Grass beef has higher omega-3 oils even than salmon, conjugated linoleic acids. Wall Street Journal, grass milk. It's what customers want because it's healthy. So what can you do? You don't run cows. <laughs> if you have a piece of ground, become acquainted with the soil. Go food. Recycle your compost and build soil. We have to create a whole new narrative. As Alan said, so much of what we think we know is wrong. We have to build a whole new economy. But as Wendell says, it has to start with what we stand on, our home, this earth. When you're standing at the edge of a cliff, which I would argue is where humanity is now, the only smart thing to do is take a step back and turn around. And when you turn around, you see all that we've forgotten. The indigenous wisdom, the beauty of the intact land that we have left. We're humans. We can learn. We can change our minds. My old boss, Dave Brower, used to say, what do we want the earth to be like 50 years from now? Let's do a little dreaming. Aim high, he said. Navigators have aimed at the stars for centuries. They haven't hit one yet, but because they aimed high, they found their way. Maimonides said each of us must see ourselves as though the entire world is held in balance and anything that we do can tip the scale. So if you haven't signed the Soil Manifesto, that's one thing that you can do. We're here in Boulder. We have the opportunity to create our own utility. Boulder County has a lot of land that ought to be Manage with holistic plant grazing. We have to start thinking about how we manage the resources that we have here at hand. This is Bucky said, we're called to be the architects of the future, not its victims. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Alan. Um, let's take some time to engage you now in conversation with uh, these two. Why don't we bring two chairs here, and Alan and, and Hunter can sit, you know, we can talk, and if I could have Sarah, Francisca, whoever can help with microphones, that would be great. And uh, Andrea and I will remain in the background, but happy to talk about strategy and that kind of Questions? Yes, back. Sorry, if you could just give one minute, we're just getting extra microphones. Oh, okay. I'll talk loudly. Yeah, can you reset the camera to... Sure. Yeah, let's go ahead and take a question. When you're talking about livestock on grasslands, you're talking about hooked animals. So that's what, those are what you regenerate. And it's not just cows. Are you talking just cows? Are you talking sheep? Are you talking goats? Chickens? Livestock is hooked? Yeah, you can, you can use any animals. Now, some of what I'm saying is not new. If you read Sir Albert Howard and so on, 
uh, from when I was a child, he was saying how essential it was to use animals in farming and cropping practices. Now, most of the cropping takes place where it's relatively humid, or humidity distribution is good, is where most of it takes place. You can use pigs, chickens, ducks, anything to incorporate them. And there are many people doing wonderful stuff with permaculture, regenerative agriculture, etc. Um, and you can also use rotational grazing, you can use not grazing, you can use these things in the humid areas of the world. They've been used in Britain, France, Britain, for hundreds of years without causing desertification, because it doesn't occur in those areas. Okay, so they are great practices which people can use anywhere and need to be doing in crop production. Now, when it comes to addressing climate change, and desertification and violence, then you need cattle, sheep, goats, camels, any of these big animals, doesn't matter which, they can be used anywhere, and then you start needing the to plan that full complexity. You're dealing with areas that are a million hectares. You can go in there and try any grazing system you like, and it just falls on its flat, on its face. We tried that sort of thing. So many of these practices are okay. You get away with them. Um, they'll produce good results where it's relatively humid. But if we're going to address climate change and desertification, then you have to start looking at the goats and above, sheep and above, and they're very big herds. You need to get millions of animals together. Now, we have no idea of what the productivity of our land can be. We have these stories, you mentioned some of them, the soil that deep. All the early stuff described here with the pioneers, the big herds of bison they saw running to millions, remember that was a remnant. There are about 11 large mammal species in North America. There used to be another 40 species. After humans got here, Almost all of that was wiped out and replaced with fire. So the degradation we're seeing began 10, 15,000 years ago. As recently as 9,000 years ago, many of those species were available here in Australia. It was longer, 50,000 when Aborigines got there and converted that whole continent from a fire phobic vegetation to a fire dependent vegetation. Again, wiped out nearly all the mammal species. So we are going to have to do the desertification, go to the larger animals. Just two, two, two seconds, just to add to you when you talk about the foods. Uh, the foods are part of it, the saliva is part of it, the moisture in there you got, and all the microbiology there that helps complete the cycle of life in the grasslands that was done by the herbivory and put it back into the soil. Otherwise, all that stands there and there's no biological decay taking place. That's why we have resorted to fire or other mechanisms to incorporate that back into the soil and if the, the herbivory that doesn't through the moisture and the biological activity. Back here first. Oh, right here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Does the prehistoric diversity in North America suggest that those of us who are just beginning to engage in uh, a grazing plan should be considering other, more species than what is commonly available in, say, conventional ranching? Today, and I'm thinking beyond, uh, well, bison certainly, but perhaps beyond bison, or do we have enough domesticated species available to us now to create the kind of regeneration you're talking about? You have enough species now. If you the more diversity you get, uh, the better, but the essential thing is surviving economically, socially, building community, all the stuff that Hunter was talking about. You, the decisions have to be made to deal with the whole complexity. Uh, you don't manage for a species or just for diversity. The whole, when you make decisions holistically, 
and the, the use of some checking questions to, to see that the actions are in context. It makes you look at the whole thing economically, socially, culturally, etc. That's how you make the decision, not on, on, uh, on trying to just get diversity or whatever. But in principle, the greater the diversity, the better. And when I say we don't know what the eventual capacity of our land is, I am learning that firsthand. Jody and I live half the year in Africa on a ranch there. Very briefly, uh, I owned it many years ago, um, gave it away, and the chiefs are trustees with me. Um, originally, when I bought that ranch, it ran 100 head of cattle. And it was in very bad shape. We have put it into very good shape. It's won international awards using 500 cattle and sheep and goats. But the sheep and goats are relatively low numbers, mostly for our feed, etc. We've now gone through eight years of average to below average rainfall, and we are now trying to raise the money to take the cattle numbers up to a thousand. So we've gone from a hundred head. We will be going to a thousand head after eight quarter average years, and that has also, including all the elephants, the buffalo, the giraffe, the sable, the woodbuck, the kudu, the bushbuck, the impala, the zebra, all the other game that we have on that place. So I'm sitting there just saying, wow, this is incredible learning. I mean, people come in and say, what's the eventual capacity? I say, I have no idea, we're learning. But all I know is the capacity of the world's grasslands, I now know, are far higher than anything you can dream of. That I can assure you. Thank you. Excuse me, I want to thank both of you for being here and taking what you're taking to Paris on all of our behalf. That's wonderful. I have a three part question and I'll be brief. Um, first of all, I just want to point out the etymology of the word human, it seems, might be connected to the word humus. As well as humor and humility. That's what I've learned somewhere along the way. Um, no, no problem. Might need some for us to keep in mind. Um, question number one, and if I could just rattle them off and let you guys tackle them. Number one, what a biochar. Number two, um, how much can we really do? And, and Hunter, I'm so glad that you uh, had some of the slides toward the end there uh, in our own yards. You know, we've built these neighborhoods all across these grasslands in this part of the world. And I happen to believe that there could be a lot done there, uh, not only for uh, greenhouse gas sequestration, but also for our own psycho-spiritual well-being. So when it comes to working within our yards and building soil, how much can really be done? And then third, Hunter, if I could be so bold as to impose upon you to ask this crowd a question that was asked last week at the encyclical event, how many folks, uh, have touched the soil deliberately in the last 24 hours. Thanks. Yeah, how many? It's older. <laughs> biochar. Dr. Tim Flannery, the great Australian scientist, said biochar is the technology that will save humanity. Biochar is any organic material cooked at low temperature in the absence or near absence of oxygen. It produces a char and a sludgy oil-like substance, which, by the way, can be a feedstock for petrochemicals, well, non-petrochemicals, if you want to get rid of the oil entirely. How do you do it? How do you take biochar to scale? Biochar has a lot of uses. When you put it in the soil, because of the grain structure, it tends to stay there. And so it sequesters carbon. But it's very labor intensive to do that at scale. It has lots of uses. Alison Burchell, who is not here tonight, but a uh, great Boulder resident, has been pushing biochar for a long time. And she uses it for reclaiming uh, old mines. If we were to biochar the beetle kill and use it in the forests, that would be a good thing. I don't think we can do it at the scale. We certainly cannot do it at the scale that Alan is suggesting with the massive herds of animals that used to be on the grasslands, that could be on the grasslands again, that could be feeding people that are in need of food, for which there is a business case. So until somebody shows me a real business case for biochar, 
cool technology, I like it, and I don't think it is the solution. Our yards, yeah, lots of things you can do with your yards. Stop having large quantities of water-intensive, chemical-intensive, labor-intensive grass, and start growing your own food. Or xeriscaping. We, this is a dry area, and so we ought not to have as much lawn. And I'm the prime violator of that. I have a nice fat lawn, all surrounded by horses. And um, okay, so this is mostly for Hunter. Mostly, mostly for Hunter, and also for Alan. Uh, I live in the foothills above Boulder, and there's some high uh, mountain uh, ecosystem plus grasslands in these high valleys, and a lot of the residents spend serious money having the grasses clipped to for fire suppression. And you know, would this be a smart time to, to ask my neighbors to to come again to bring in goats? Is this the next step? I mean, is this the way to go? Is to bring in goats into these um, semi suburban areas where there's plenty of open space and it's grasslands. What do you what do you think? Let me try and deal with the bar char and that together. You out there are going to be confused by lots of different views. You can do this, you can do that, you can do the other. You can do baja, you could use goats, you could do blah 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 blah. This is how we are. Alright? Now what I'd like to do after years of working with people is with every idea to just say it's a good idea. Why? Because I don't know until I have the context. Should I like files? Quickly, I've got my matches. Should I not fire them? Quickly, tell me. You see, if I light a fire, um, and you don't ask me what's the reason, the explanation, the context, it might be a totally senseless thing to do and burn the building down. Once you have the context for the decision, you can now say yes, that's wise or not. So when you ask me, should I use goats? I have the clues. I'd like to say, should I light fire? When you say, what about fire char? I have no clue, because I don't know the context. That is what holistic management's about. Everything we make is not complex, including space exploration. It's not renewable, self-renewing. If a battery goes flat, it doesn't work. Everything we make is complicated, but by definition not complex. Everything we manage from our households to international policies involves complexity human organizations, families, environment, economy. Right? Now, right now, we've got ourselves into trouble because we use a genetically embedded way of making decisions which we didn't know. All tool using animals use it. Every conscious action you take, every conscious action will have an objective. And you do have reasons. So in the biotech case, it might be trying to address uh, climate change. In the goat case, it might be trying to reduce the fire danger. Whatever. That's too simplistic. For every one of our actions today, we do it because we need, desire, uh, profit, uh, deal with a problem. Every single policy of every government, the context is the problem. Be it drugs, be it terrorism, be it not just weeds, whatever. The problem is the context. That is the mechanistic worldview that has got us into this situation. That is why it is in management worldwide that things are getting worse and worse and worse and worse. We get isolated bits of apparent success and then it gets overwhelmed. What we realized back in 1984 was we needed a context for our actions that could address the complexity. That if we reduce the context to need, desire, profit, dealing with a problem, that is reductionist. Even if we have the most sophisticated scientific team doing that management. Right? So we had to come up with something that would give us a context where, in which we could make that decision. And that was the hardest thing for us to put together, because there was nothing in any branch of science, philosophy, religion, we were sort of looking for a vacuum. Didn't know what it was. And little by little that fell into place. So everything we do now with holistic management 
is we first look at the situation under management and get the people there to define how they want their lives to be. And we tie that to the life supporting environment, functioning as it will have to be functioning 500 years from now for your great great grandchildren to be living a life like that. Now we have a context. And now we would take that boats or the biomass and say, good idea. Now let's look at it in that context. And we run it through seven little filtering questions to look at the source of the money, the source of the energy, the pattern of use in this context, etc. Train people to do it very quickly. At the end of that, we see, okay, that would be good. So that's how we would decide. Now, having said that, and knowing that most people want better lives tied to a more healthy environment, biochar will almost always fail that testing, except in a humid environments on a small scale. Forget it for depressing climate change. Not going to do it. And it's a good idea. It's a wonderful thing. There's nothing wrong with biochar. It's just when you get to the scale and the cultures you're dealing with and you can't eat biochar, you can eat goats, and you start looking at the whole complex together, you just be doing it with animals. And with the goats, often you'd be using the goats. Often, and meanwhile, really beginning to do that, you'd end up using livestock. I looked at a very good documentary, I really enjoyed it, on the mega fires. They, you know, we're getting these big fires, probably than anything we'd experience. They're occurring at higher um, altitudes and latitudes than we've ever had before. And in that whole documentary, unsurprisingly, the only remedy they had was more fire. Not surprising, because no technology in the world can solve that. And if you've only got technology and fire, you're going to use one of them. Now that is solvable if you start using livestock to replace what we were doing with fire. But it is a case, honestly, of almost every idea is good until you have a context. Then you could start saying, yes, this is what I have to do in this situation. By the way, on goats, uh, we tried goats on the Windstar before we brought in the cattle. Uh, the goats all jumped the fences. <laughs> I must admit, I am now a goat roper. <laughs> and uh, your lion would love those goats. My lion. And I thought I took a nap with a goat. <laughs> Uh, hi, I really appreciate this a whole uh, realm of knowledge that is completely new to me. And I would like, if it's possible, to take one step back in the information cycle. You, uh, so we have a desertification, let's say, in southeastern Colorado and BLM. We can't just put animals on there, can we? I mean, there's not enough for them to eat, so is there a step in that I don't understand, or could you help me? So then I can talk to other people about this. Yeah, before I ever let holistic plan grazing loose on anyone, a, the biggest ranching company in the world that there's ever been uh, came to me for help. We had a quarter acre ranch, 60,000 cows, um, 60,000 cows. The, Bottom end of this long ranch had become just desert, and I said to them, Look, everybody in the world says I'm wrong. This is what I want you to do, and, uh, but I don't want you to take any risk. So I arranged with them, and they gave me the worst land we could find in Rhodesia. Not a single blade of grass for a hundred miles drive. Just tree trunks, shrubs, desert shrubs, etc. left. They gave me 4,000 acres of that, and I said, I want your most difficult animals to manage, first carving heifers. And I said, fine, I want to put in a fence layout, because we were still using fences, and uh, I put it in, and I went to double the livestock numbers immediately, proved wrong, and I had to go to three times the numbers immediately, and we just grew, grew solid perennial and then we went ahead on the whole ranch. Uh, we've never had to feed animals on the range. 
when we make the decisions holistically, we work out how to do it. Where we have fed animals, uh, like the shots you saw from the early mine reclamation we were doing, when you're dealing with mine reclamation, you have a hunt on bare ground. But out on in all of Colorado, all of the worst in the United States, if there are this bushes, shrubs, things that animals are eating, we start with that. And we start concentrating, moving them right away and growing the grass right away. So I, I am a regenerative landscaper, and so we do a lot of soil building and new build soils and stuff like that. We do a lot of rainwater diversion and stuff like that. How would you holistically manage it to imitate what you're doing with animals in a small landscape? Because there are so many urban landscapes that they would definitely make a difference if we were to do something with it, other than like, like growing your own food. As Ellen was saying, the holistic management is a lot more than just having an animal on a piece of ground. It's a, it's a whole decision-making process of understanding the purpose, setting your holistic purpose for that piece of ground, Understanding who the people are that are involved with it, having them involved in the decision making, and it's working through every step of that. When I first tried it, I shortcutted it. I, mean, I don't need all this extra process. <laughs> Wound up getting fired. The process really does matter. And I would strongly recommend that you talk with Danielle, get, there's a whole online learning curriculum of what is holistic management and how do you do it. And it would apply just as well to what it is you're doing as to running large numbers of cattle on, on rangeland. If you walked through the process and then drew from it to your own business, it can be used in almost any setting. So I can't really answer it because I don't know which piece of ground you are dealing with and what people you're dealing with, and it's very much what Alan said earlier. It, it's context specific. So it's what's your context, what's your desired outcome, and then walking through this whole process. But again, this web-based learning tool that the uh, Savory Institute has is just brilliant, and I highly recommend it. I do want to speak about the issue of piece of land. Well, I'm just talking like like landscapes in people's yards. So maybe, you know, anywhere from a thousand square feet to ten thousand square feet. I'm talking small scale management. So like even maintaining it, say cutting the grasses once a year, uh, to to kind of imitate what the animals are doing in that space to sequester more carbon. Well, you know, the, the, the regenerative ag movement of Part of it. There's so many people in permaculture, regenerative agriculture doing really good work. Harvesting water off the roofs, impervious pavements, etc. Um, you can bring small stock in ducks, chickens, whatever on it. Now, if you are landscaping like that and you have small plots around Washington or uh, New York or anything, it's not a big deal because it's not preserved for now, if you have small plots around Santa Fe, Alberta, here, uh, and small plots become 10 acres, 12 acres, a couple of horses, it, it desertifies badly. Now, in most cases, when people begin managing holistically, the big thing is to start working as a community and not confusing ownership and management. Because you could own 10 acres, I could own 5 acres, somebody else owns 10. We've got our homes on it, we can do our gardening on it. Etc. But once you put that cumulatively together, if it's in a brittle environment and it's needing large stock, all right, we can't do it on our small units of land. They're too small, the numbers of animals are too low, etc. But if we combine, we can do it. You see, if we, we just manage the, the, the plots that are not garden, that are just grassland, 
we just manage them collectively and just to work as a community. Corridors help with the distribution of species, and there's, there's a lot of good work going on in that. Migration, people keep talking about migration. Migration doesn't happen in many areas. Um, a lot of people will talk about migration in uh, Central Africa or parts here, and some species might migrate, birds or whatever. In uh, some areas where rains can start hundreds of miles north and they haven't started south, with a bigger beast or, like you see in East Africa, that actually migrate. Most animals work in home ranges and territories and don't actually migrate. So we just use the same principles. Um, and in these situations where animals are still migrating and pastures are working, like in, in Kenya and so on, uh, Joby and I spent 12 days riding around on horseback not long ago. Uh, with some folks there looking at everywhere we went, the land was deteriorating. So the, the fact that you've got migrating million bullies isn't helping when you've got pastures there as well with too many herds. So it, it ends up uh, deteriorating land. And again, we're not going to solve that until we get all those people making their decisions together holistically and then you start integrating the wildlife and the livestock. But nobody would like more than I would to be able to return to just wildlife managing the land. I actually coined the words game ranching, but I was trying to save the Banguilla lechery in what uh, used to be Northern Rhodesia. And uh, then later working with two American Fulbrighters, got the game ranching industry going. It's a multi-billion dollar industry now, mostly Texas and South Africa. Every single game ranch I have visited, the land is deteriorated. We can't do it with the wildlife alone now. We have our training centre near the Victoria Falls, and I hope you'll all come and visit. Very easy to visit, you can come and see it there. Now, visitors who come there, we take them to the nearby national parks. We've got three big, well-known national parks. Toby National Park, Zerbizi National Park, Wacky National Park. These are known to millions of acres. We take them there to see the loss of biodiversity. The degradation in the national parks now is terrible. And then we come back onto our land, where we have the same land, same rainfall, same wild animals, the same elephants, the same lions, everything, and we can't keep pace with the production now, where we're integrating the cattle with the wildlife. For the wildlife alone, we couldn't do it. There's just too much interference with movements, with predator numbers, it's just not natural anymore, not functioning. Great film, Polyfaces, in which Alan is interviewed, focusing on the work of Joel Salatin, who took a plapped out Virginia farm and using this approach brought back to amazing productivity. So watch for this film, it will be available shortly. Nominated for an Oscar. Beautiful film. This has been fascinating. Um, the recommendations now, you know, with Louis' movie, Chase of Extinction, and a lot of the other recommendations as far as addressing climate change is to stop eating meat, stop eating beef. And so we think about the factory farms and you know, the, the water quality problems and like, horrific situations. And what you're describing is something you know, beautiful and wonderful and something we should aspire to. So how do we begin making those transitions? How do we engage in those conversations? Because it's such a polarized difference. And I was there that day when you were having... Oh my God, the side of the Yes, exactly. And so people just completely 
don't get it. So maybe you can give us some guidance on conversations because I felt I got it this evening, but I didn't get it listening to the, the quick back and forth. So giving us some guidance would be really helpful in how to engage in this kind of conversation. Um, <coughs> I mentioned to Tanya earlier, I actually like the beans. I said, well, <laughs> The, the reason why I do it is because I'm not apathetic. The thing that's killing us is apathy. It really is. And they're not apathetic. They care deeply. They're very concerned. They're prepared to take action. They're mostly, all the ones I know, are intelligent, well-read. And I agree with them 100% with industrial production of pork, beef, everything. It, it should be illegal. It is so environmentally damaging, so economically damaging, so socially damaging. Health, there is not a single positive point to it. We, if the public would only get behind them on that and absolutely condemn it, refuse to eat the damn stuff, all right? They're 100% right. Now, listen to what I said earlier. If you carry that now and become a vegan, for environmental or ethical reasons, you're doing damage. Because nothing but livestock is going to save the United States and stop the desertification of Colorado, Texas, Nevada, California, you know, etc. That vast area across North Africa that I mentioned up into China, those people don't have our luxury of choosing what they eat. They're dying as we talk. Right? 95% percent of the land can only feed people from animals. So if we, if I was to become a vegan, I would draw a very clear distinction between industrial agriculture and not, and I would condemn the management. You see, not the animals. The animals are totally innocent. Because if we condemn the animals as they're doing, no, they're not being ethical, we're showing no compassion, no empathy for starving mothers and children, violence, and all the stuff that we're living with in Africa, and more that is to come. So, they're intelligent people. If we can just get them to start discussing, talking with us, really understanding that what they need to be doing is by all means, be vegan if you want to for your own health, but don't do it for the sake of the environment, or to be ethical to humans or the environment, because they're endangering humanity. So they need to really do what they're doing, but limit it to the management of the animals in the industrial agriculture production. Does that help? Thank you. I don't care if you eat the animal, as long as it's on the ground. But again, the problem with biochar is there's not, at least I haven't yet seen a business model for it, if you stop eating the animals, you lose the business model. And it's the business model that will allow this to spread. So what can you do? Buy beef, lamb, pork, from people who raise it holistically. How can you know whether or not they do? Ask them. Go visit their place. They're, again, we live in Boulder. There are uh, places here that sell this stuff. So, yeah, you're going to pay a little bit more. It's worth it. I should have added, you know, some of the ethical stuff that they put is that they <clears throat> don't want to kill the animals. And again, they're intelligent people. If they just discuss that a little bit more, you would realize that if you don't kill the animals that you need to use to fight climate change, desertification, violence, future Tuntao bombings, and all the stuff that I talked of, if you don't want to kill the animals, think about it for a moment. Let's just use common sense. They die. How do they die? They die of accidents, disease, or starvation. None of those are pleasant deaths. It's far more humane to have a pastoralist, a herder, a rancher, whatever, raising animals in peace and calm and having a wonderful life, and they end their lives humanely and suddenly. It's far more humane to kill the animals than to leave them to die of accident, disease, starvation. 
And again, when you take animals off the land, I mean, vegans will typically answer, well, then don't have animals. That's where you get into the problem. You take them off the land, that's what I got with on the land star. 20 years without cattle, the land degraded. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'll take it. So as, a, as an urbanite, someone who's on a small parcel in Boulder and we pride ourselves on that density uh, and its environmental benefits, I hear these inspiring ideas. And, uh, and I'm aware that we've created a network of public land managers and ranch owners who are putting these ideas to work. Um, but I'm wondering, and, and I hear that as, as people who don't, aren't directly involved in public land management or don't have ranches, we can do things, get involved in polyculture, do good landscape uh, management by, uh, you know, consuming in, in a way that supports these businesses and these land use practices. But I guess I, and maybe this is a question for you, Ben, now, and maybe for Alan. How does how the Savory Institute um, doing projects that would allow us to be engaged as people who aren't directly involved in land use management? You mentioned you're doing community conversations. I'm just curious, how can we stay involved? and contribute to the work of the Institute, what is the Institute doing to support the involvement of people who are not directly involved in working on the land? Um, thank you. Um, huh, what are we doing? Um, one of the things we realized is that uh, we were be trying to solve very global big issues, and we were not going to do it from Boulder. It had to be done in many, many places around the world uh, in contextually relevant ways. And so we deployed a strategy of hubs around the world. We're bringing around 10 each year. We have a hub in Colorado. Jeff, are you here, Jeff? Uh, the Place Conservation Center is the place that represents the work of the Sacred Industries. Think of it as a pseudo franchise approach, like our distribution network. And the distribution is of awareness, education, tools, support, implementation support, investment, incubation of solutions to the local problems and the local issues. Uh, we're working in collaboration, for, for example, here in Colorado with the Nature Conservancy or organizations that are trying to see okay, if we're going to use livestock, how do we incorporate conservation values into and we have had great success with them and in a collaboration of around five years now, several pilot cases in which all the conservation values were after moving. And I think that Fred is here. Is Deb still here? Did we Deb? A little, I thought her. Deb has been one of our biggest supporters. They have seen all these conservation values plus financially for TNC and for the branch managers, things are better and production productivity will stay uh, great into the, into the uh, drought like three months longer than the neighbors. Oh, great, thanks. Then we said, okay, we start putting the boots on the ground and the distribution networks. Now we need to engage the, uh, the communities. And that has been saying for a long time until public opinion changes. Corporations, institutions won't change because they cannot by design lead, they are following public opinion, so how do we shift public opinion? So, um, we've been thinking about this, so Civil Institute was funded six years ago, and we've been doing a lot of these policies in place and putting the infrastructure in place to distribute these things. And now we're thinking how we work more together with our communities that are local hubs around the world, 27 so far, we have around 10 more coming in 2016, can do similar things in their own context. One of the things we're working on is what we call a champions program. And it may be called something else after we work with our branding specialists. But the fact is how urbanites think of cities as places where education happens, research happens, investment happens, policy making happens, a lot of these things happen in cities, disconnected from all that immensity that we're trying to solve. So how do we become more informed, like it happened today, that finally thought of how do we create solutions that we don't create them, the community create solutions that are contextually relevant for themselves. So the Sailor Institute is about facilitating opportunities for these. So we hope that a champion program or something like that that could go to schools, universities, rotary clubs, other organizations can begin 
feeding, you know, putting the seeds in place for these dialogues to start spreading quicker in the urbans, in the urban areas of, of the world where a lot of these decisions are happening. So we decided on these dialogues, we decided on, on many other little things that we can do, but any ideas that you have, any any opportunities, a lot of partnering among organizations that was very inspired at your place, Centre like where collaborating with Hunter, having breakfast together in at your meeting, seeing the two ladies that are, and, and, and remind me of your name, Julie. 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 And Julie, and truly interested and engaged citizens that, you know, are them. And so they are the ones that are going to bring about change in their own network. So our hope is to give the tools, some of the tools needed for you to start long conversations and facilitate however we can that those conversations continue to, to happen and to be informed and to be uh, nurtured and nourished as we want us all to be. So a lot of tools will be web-based, a lot of campaigns like the, the one we just launched. We have two for next year that are going to raise our heartbeat quite a bit because we're going to get into these meaty issues. But the idea is let's, let's work together. Let's see what those contextual local um, solutions are for for each one, you know, each one region in which we're working. So if you have ideas, reach out, let's have conversations. We are having conversations. Let's continue to do our best to to bring them forth. Trey, any anything else you want to add to that? <laughs> Having parties, maybe, maybe you know, we buy and, and that is the top of the bar. And we want it to be a little bit of like a secret society party or something. That will become more fun than just the big event which, which we over talked at rather than the, the conversation. And so, being 10 to 8, I want to invite Trey uh, to close. And Trey has been, thank you so much, Alan Hunter, and you're welcome to stay on the stage. Um, a lot of the changes and a lot of the engagement that we hope to see based on what you said. I think it, 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 it's also a question of, of consciousness or how disengaged we become or disconnected we become of, of, of the very source of sustenance for ourselves and, and how we can reconnect that. We, the conversation with Hunter last week, you know, how the spiritual communities have an amazing um, um, opportunity to be, begin addressing soils and, and these issues as true moral issues that need to be paid attention to because all of our well-being and of all the species on Earth, all life on Earth, depends on that. But um, Trey, um, I had the pleasure of meeting him six years ago when I was looking for a CFL. He ended up being a facilitator of, of our, uh, a meeting we had. He did an amazing job. And um, then he came on board as a CFO and then as the CEO of and one of the amazing things about Trey, about being a great entrepreneur, and he has several awards in, in Boulder, he thinks that way, um, he is, uh, he has a background in theology and philosophy, and he has studied um, religion and, and, and faith, and he's very involved in his faith community, and he started to say, you know, I think there's, there's a role here in, in, in the spiritual realm to begin thinking how we shift consciousness to address these issues in, in a more effective way. So uh, he started exploring more and more, you know, after his exposure to holistic management, all those connections. And it was uh, quite inspiring to uh, see him uh, excited about these issues. And 
So I ask him to close on that note today and put us all in a more you know, inspired state of mind and heart and soul so we can go and find what is outside of the typical actionable items of our open freedom society. <laughs> um, but he has a lot to also of those operational things. But, um, but how do we engage at a different level with our hearts and our souls and our consciousness to do the things that we need to, to do? So to all of that, I would like to invite you to close with me. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thank you, Dina. Uh, it's, it's been a pleasure to be a part of the Center Institute over the last six years and see my life transform in bringing things together that I didn't see until, uh, as some, uh, people's eyes are opened in, in seeing and recognizing things that they hadn't seen before. Uh, I was uh, rock in a... Um, community down in uh, the southern part of the United States in Dallas, where I grew up in the city. Uh, New City is best as most, most people would know a city environment to be. And the most I could aspire to in terms of trying to change the world was something that came from that environment that I was in, which was a part of my faith community. And so I had committed at a young age that uh, that's what I was going to do. I was going to be a pastor. I was going to be someone who was going to be with people and help them see that life could be meaningful, life could be transformational, and could create real opportunities for themselves and the people that they were with. But I was disillusioned fairly quickly into that space and, and realized that most of what was happening in that space was a space that resulted in getting people to come and attend and do things in the event base, but it was taking people away from the relationships and in the places that they needed to be. And uh, I decided, well, what did I do? So I'll start a business. And said, well, I'll just spend 8 to 10 hours a day with people. And, and that's what that's going to be. So in 1997, I started a business in Boulder. And I uh, grew that business to a pretty good size, over 150 people here in Boulder. And, and, and built a community of life, what we called it, was a, a transformational, life-changing community of people that were about doing something else, but being together was important. And I recognized that that idea of that financial sustainability was as important as that religious or faith-based conversation that was going on. So we started bringing people into the community that were there just to be with them. And so we had we were one of the first one of the first organizations in Boulder that had a, a full-time chaplain that actually spent time people on staff, who came in every day and played the guitar, made himself available to people for opportunities to address issues that were beyond the financial, that were beyond the business, that was a part of that faith, spiritual, consciousness piece. And then, as I transitioned out of that business, I moved into the what, what I would call is that true holistic perspective of recognizing that we could not have either of the things that we're talking about. We could not have society as we know it without the soil. And the soil understanding its place as foundational, as a part of that cycle that completes everything, to me was the inspiration that I needed as I began to see what this next path would be as we as a society would recognize the need to no longer be sitting in our silos, but recognizing the need to cross the aisle, both politically, socially, ecologically. The fact that our monocultures exist in multiple aspects of our lives is killing us. It needs to be very diverse. It needs to be a culture of poly, not mono. And as a result, that, that, that whole awareness that came to me through this process allowed me to enrich that faith piece that was so important to me. It allowed me to enrich the idea of what it means to be sustainable from a financial standpoint. And it's allowed me to be able to bring all those things together in a way where I truly see something that is more of a holistic revolution that's regenerating soils, souls, and society. It is something that we can bring all together in something that is far more uh, transformational and beautiful in terms of recognizing the power of all three 
in a real concentric circle, but in the middle of all of that is a consciousness that is far, far more meaningful than anything we've experienced up to this point. And the only way we're going to do that is be able to get beyond ourselves. And that is, I think, the greatest challenge our society has in front of us. As Alan said, this is not about the tools. This is not about the animals. This is not about the things that we've used to be able to address some of the issues that we have and the challenges we have. It's about our ability to manage those complex things. So one of his favorites, which has become now one of my favorite inspirations to this idea of holism, what it means to be holistic, is Jan, is Jan Smuts. And he wrote Holism and Evolution. This is what he said. This is a good world. We need not approve all the items in it, nor all the individuals in it. But the world itself, which is more than its parts or individuals, which has a soul, a spirit, a fundamental relation to each of us, deeper than all other relations. And I, I just don't want to forget that. I think we just so, so many times find ourselves isolated in our thinking, isolated in our homes, isolated from community, and forget the fact that we are interconnected, that there is no way that a decision in one realm doesn't affect another one. And, you know, one of the other inspirational books, Voltaire's Bastards, John Alston Saul said this, the reality is the division of knowledge into feudal fiefdoms of expertise has made general understanding and coordinated action not simply impossible, but despised and distrusted. Why is it, as a society, we can't break the walls down and then begin to recognize that our solution is one another, moving forward together, defining the context and making these things happen in a way that will truly build bridges and not create isolationism. And the last thing that I'll close with is something, and it's from a, uh, um, a Catholic monk, Thomas Merton, and he's one of my favorite authors, in Love and Living. And this is what he says. If man is to recover his sanity and spiritual balance, there must be a renewal of community between the traditional, the contemplative disciplines, those of science, between the poet and the physicist, the priest and the psychologist, and the monk and the politician. This is not about us separating ourselves. This is true unity. Unity that would give us the hope, that would give us the opportunity to truly make a difference in this local community and the global humanity that we all need from this point going forward. So thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. It is an inspiration to be in a community that does value these things, but as you leave, think about ways that you can build bridges, increase the opportunity in conversation, connect with the Sager Institute or your other uh, advocates, advocates and activists beside you that really, truly want to make a difference because that's the only way we really will.